John 17 is where we're going to be this morning. John 17. We've already read the passage, um, and um, um, Abby did a phenomenal job reading the passage for us. But the last three to four weeks, we have been seeing an emphasis that Jesus makes on the call that each of us have to be on mission for Jesus. He communicates to us that we are loved by him so that we can be on mission for him. And after he communicates how much he loves us, he then turns the table and then he tells us, hey, because I love you, the world is going to hate you. The systems of the world are not going to understand you. They're going to turn their backs on you. And last week we saw in John 16, we saw five truths or principles that we need to know if we're truly going to be fruitful and live a life on mission for Jesus. First, we need to know that we're going to face opposition and hatred because Jesus faced that as well. Jesus faced people that would turn on him. Then, but in the midst of that, we need to be reminded that we're not alone because the Holy Spirit resides in us, and he's working in us to change us and through us transform the world that he has placed us in. Then, as we live on for mission for Jesus, we're going to experience highs and lows. There are going to be some days where you're on fire for Jesus, and then there's going to be some days where you're going to not want to even get out of bed, and God knows that. God understands that. And yet, as we live for Jesus... And as we go through our highs and lows, we need to be reminded that God loves us not based on our performance for Jesus. God loves us because of Jesus. That our performance doesn't elevate or decrease God's love for us. God's love for us is the same no matter what. And finally, we saw last week that Jesus has overcome the world. And because he has overcome the world, we too will be able to overcome the world. And this morning, we're going to get to the culmination of a point in the teachings of Jesus. Back in Matthew 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told his followers that they are to be the salt of the earth, a preservative used to hold back the decay of the world. They are to make a difference in the world by showing mercy and love, and by your good works, the world is supposed to glorify the Father. He told them in Matthew 5 that we're to be the light of the world, a city on a hill that collectively lights up to show the world the value, the worth, and glory of Jesus as we are on mission with the gospel. And here in John's gospel, in his last meeting with his disciples, right before he is betrayed and crucified, he tells his followers again and again numerous times in John 14, 15, 16, that you are to love one another so that the world might see Jesus in them. John 13, by this All the world will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus has given his final marching orders and he is going to send his disciples into the world to show, with the gospel, to show mercy, be on mission to see people come and know him. And he even says in prayer here, right before his betrayal in verse 18, he says, as you've sent me into the world, so now I send them into the world. And when he is resurrected in John 20, which we'll see in a few weeks, Jesus is going to say to us, as the Father sent me, so now I send you. So we come to this passage this morning in John 17, and we find Jesus' last words before his death and resurrection and the inauguration of his mission. He's going to send them out as he passes through the night with them, heading to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he will be betrayed. He huddles them around, and his last words are in fact words of a prayer. He begins to pray over his disciples and by extension begins to pray for you and I here 2,000 years later. And our text this morning is a prayer that Jesus prays for us. He prays for his disciples as he's on the precipice of the greatest suffering the world has ever known or ever will know. And you and I get to be a fly on the olive tree next to them and we get to hear what it's like for God to speak to God. And as Jesus prays for them to be on mission, we get to know that he is praying for us as well. And so Jesus, like a general, is getting ready to dispatch his soldiers into war, and he gathers them around, and he talks to the Father for them. And so our last, so our last orders before moving out on mission is that we will have five marching orders from here in John 17. Five things I want you to see from our text. Number one, The first marching order as we live on mission for Jesus is to glorify God. It's to glorify God. Verse 1 says it this way. Jesus spoke these things 
looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you. I guess the thing's not working. So John 17 is where we're at if you have your Bibles. John 17, verse 1. Jesus spoke these things, looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you. The first thing that Jesus prays is that he would be glorified. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty self-centered. Hey, make me glorious. Make me famous. Should it? He knows what the disciples are about to endure. He knows that um, the disciples are going to face hardships. In fact, he just told them, hey, some of you are going to die for the faith, and so at least pray for their safety. Or if they do fail, don't let them fail badly. Or he knows the group around him, right? He goes, hey, give Thomas some faith. Help him not to doubt so much. Or help Peter stop, to talk, stop talking so much because he just blabbers on and on and on. And, but he doesn't pray that. In fact, the disciples aren't even mentioned until we get to verse 9. The first eight verses of John 17 is God glorifying God. But Jesus praying for his glory and the glory of the Father is actually, in fact, a prayer for our joy. Nothing delights God more than God delighting in God. I've told you before, it's like parenting. Every morning at 6 a.m., my boy's alarm will go off, and they will run to my room, right? And they will wake us up. And sometimes, just to antagonize them, I will hug Anne just a little tighter because Micah wants to jump in between us, right? And he wants to break us apart. So I'll hold on to Anne and not let go, and he will push and he will shove just to make sure he gets in between. But in the process of that, he enjoys the struggle. He enjoys the fight. He enjoys trying to separate us. He's not getting angry. He's just enjoying the fact that daddy loves to be with mommy and mommy loves to be with daddy. He delights in that. And so it is with us, with God. We delight deep down to know that God loves God, that the Father loves the Son and the Son loves the Father. God's delight in God and seeing the Father tell the Son before everyone at his baptism, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And to hear the Son here in John 17 say, glorify your Son so that the Son might glorify you is our highest joy. C.S. Lewis said that he had a hard time believing in Jesus. As he was beginning to believe in Jesus, he had this one hang-up that, was really str- that he really struggled with. And his struggle was the commands in Scripture to praise God, especially in the Psalms. They'll say, make much of Jesus. And this is C.S. Lewis's words, not mine, so don't hold this against me. He said, it was like some woman who was always wanting compliments for herself. Praise me. Look, tell me how look good I look. Tell me how nice I am. And he realized at that moment that the whole world is full of people praising what they enjoy. Readers praise their favorite writers. Hikers will talk about their favorite trails. Players will talk about their favorite games. Foodies will talk about their favorite restaurants. Those who like losing will talk about the cowboys. We, <laughs> we only praise that which is our highest joy, what makes us the most happy. So Jesus is not vain or selfish when he prays first and foremost that we would see his glory. See, his glory is where the highest joy is found so that the more that he is glorified, the more happy we become. It's how we are wired. This is why when he was teaching his disciples to pray in Matthew 6, his first words were, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because, friends, this is where our greatest joy is found. See, our problem is that we tend to think that we would be more happy if our kingdom comes, if our will is done, that if God would just give us whatever we want. And see, but Jesus wants us to center our mission on his glory because if we don't, we'll end up striving for what we think is best for us And in doing so, we'll try to make every effort to simply ensure comfort and ease and the least amount of trouble possible, and we'll be at the end miserable because the mission will fail. 
we will realize that the things that we pursued ultimately disappoint us. But in order to get the heights of joy and mission to succeed, it is going to require a lot of pain. It's going to require a lot of suffering. And it's a really hard prayer for us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, instead of my kingdom come, my will be done. Your kingdom come is a dangerous prayer. It means the death of your own sovereignty. It means that your life will be shaped by the will of someone else. It means that you will experience the messiness, the discomfort, and the difficulty of God's refining grace. It means surrendering the center of your universe to the one who alone deserves to be there. It means loving God above all else and loving your neighbor as yourself. It means experiencing the freedom that it can only be found when God breaks the bondage to yourself. It means finally living for the glory of the one who is truly glorious, the glory of God. Look at verse 2. For you gave him authority over all flesh, so he may give eternal life to all you have given him. And so here Jesus is explaining how he will be glorified, and it will be a divine gift exchange. Christmas just passed, right, a few months ago, and you've probably experienced either a work family or a family event, a work party or a family event where maybe you drew names and had to exchange gifts in the room. And then God has this kind of gift exchange here. If you look at verse 2 and verse 3, go down to verse 6. I have revealed your name to the men you have given me from the world. They are yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. I need to explain this for a little bit so I could clearly state this in a way that you can understand and don't blow your mind because when you think about the depths of what I'm about to say and what God does for us, it ought to leave you in awe and worship. See, we see the redemptive plan of God at work, a cosmic gift exchange going on here. And you and I are simply a love gift being exchanged between the Father and the Son. We see in the Bible that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are in communion in eternity past. There's perfect love, perfect unity, perfect friendship, perfect relationship without any needs at all. Acts 17 tells us this. And that love overflowed into creating a world, a world that would display and reflect that love and beauty and value. But Genesis 3 tells us that the world falls into sin. But that was all part of God's plan. Ephesians 1 tells us that the Father would choose some to be his children. And then he would send his son to rescue those children from the domain of sin. He would die on the cross and rise again, conquering sin and death and hell and Satan. He would ascend into heaven in Acts 1. And because he ascends into heaven, the Spirit will descend and indwell on his children. And all these that the Father has been given uh, will be with, the Father has given to the Son will one day be with the Son in heaven one day. And we, like a gift, will be given to the Father by the Son. And says, here are your children, so that we could worship him forever. But the Father will turn around and in an amazing act of love will turn around and give us back to Jesus so that we could adore Jesus forever. And it is us making much of Jesus forever that will make much of the Father forever. The Father is happy when the Son is praised and worshipped and adored. And in the end, we are given to Jesus, and Jesus gives us eternal life. And what is that eternal life? Is it jumping through these cloud loops with this fancy-looking harp and singing songs all the rest of eternity? Is it eternal life being sin-free? Is eternal life being with your loved ones? Look back at verse 3. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, the one you have sent, Jesus. Friends, eternal life is about God. It is knowing Jesus in order to know the Father through the work of the Spirit. It is knowing not just about them intellectually, but experientially, exclusively. This is why eternal life is not just a get-out-of-hell card. Those who have eternal life are those who love Jesus. John Piper said it this way. He said, 
If you could have heaven and all of its comfort and all of its glory and all of its splendor and all of its majesty, if you could have heaven but Jesus wasn't there and you could be happy, then you don't have eternal life. Because heaven is not about stuff, it's about a person. And that's Jesus. Friends, if you don't love Jesus, you won't love heaven and you won't be in heaven. Go back to verse 4. I have glorified you on the earth by completing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world existed. So Jesus now asks in turn that he be made much of, not by being independent of the Father, but by being with the Father. He wants to go back to fellowship with the Father, back to face-to-face -face with the Father. He wants things the way it was before he had to come to become a missionary here on earth. That glory before Jesus came was perfect fellowship, perfect friendship, perfect love, perfect unity. And Jesus is desiring that he not be left a bruised, bleeding hunk of meat on a cross, but that he is clothed again in glory with the Father, that his followers can have someone that they can marvel at and be happy in. Verse 7. Now they know that all these things you have given to me are from you, because the words that you gave me I have given them. They have received them, have known them for certain that I came from you. They have believed that you have sent me. See, the disciples at this point realize that all of this is by grace. All of this is purely God's grace and kindness. They know that everything they have is a gift from the Father. It's a gift. It's given to us. And Jesus wants his disciples to know that the first thing he wants of them is the glory to be shown in them. And his glory will be shown when they understand that the whole reason they are his and the whole reason that we are sent is because of God's grace and kindness in our lives. Jesus wants us to be people who would marvel at the glory of Jesus, at the grace of Jesus. Our first marching order is glorify God because when we do, we will be the most happiest of people. Marching order number two, trust God. Trust God. Verse nine, I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me because they're yours. Now Jesus begins to pray for his disciples. And I love that this is in the present tense. It's not in the past tense. It's in the present, meaning that Jesus is still praying for us today. This is a foreshadowing of the resurrection. Jesus will not stay dead. Let me read you a passage from Hebrews. Listen to this. Hebrews 7 says this way, the former priests were many in number. Why? Because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. In the old covenant, the priests would die. So they were never able to continue on as priests. The concluding comment for every priest was inevitable, and he died, and he died, and he died, and there was a new priest. Think about how frustrating that would be in any religion to follow someone and benefit from someone and then have them die. Think about a priest that, or a pastor that helps you connect you to God. We experience this frustration even now in many areas of our lives. You move to a different state, and you lose friends in your old state. You lose, got to find a new doctor, a new community of faith. You change our country. We change its presidents every four years or eight years. And more personally, a, spy, a spouse dies, leaving another spouse alone. That brings everything to an end. Even those we divulge much of our life to and share much of our life with, it's hard to start over with a new neighbor, a new school, a new job, a new house, a new doctor, a new pastor, or even more of a new spouse. But Jesus, on the other hand, since he's a priest forever, continually lives, and his priesthood is permanent and non-transferable because he will not stay dead. You and I will never have another high priest. He will always hear our prayers. He will always listen to our prayers. And he will always know what we need. Think about this. Jesus is the one who heard the prayers of our grandfathers and our grandmothers. Who heard the prayers of 
the historic heroes of our faith. The one who heard the prayers of Christians 2,000 years ago, and he's the same Jesus that hears your prayers and my prayers this morning. Think about all the prayers that you have prayed in your life and realize that Jesus has heard every single one of them. All the prayers that we have ever mentioned, Jesus has heard them. And he remembers all of them, and he answers every single one of them. Maybe not the way you wanted it to be answered, but he answered every single one of them. Think about how he knows you. Think about how much intimately he knows you. No one, friends, knows you like Jesus knows you. Listen, it's hard to lose someone close, someone you love, someone who knew you like no one else did, but Jesus has known you more than anyone else will know you, and he will never die, and he will never stop knowing you. He knows you all the way to the bottom better than you know yourself, and he's not going to pass you on to move on to someone else. He is our permanent living high priest. Verse 9, I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me because they're yours. All my things are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. What is he praying about? Why does he need to pray? He's praying for the security of our salvation, for the assurance of our salvation that we could trust him. Listen, friends. You can keep yourself no, lo- no more saved than you actually saved yourself in the first place. The same power that saved you is the same power that will keep you. You didn't find Jesus. Jesus found you. Jesus saved you. And if Jesus started a work in you, Scripture says he will finish that work in you. Some of you need to hear this because you (coughs) are constantly questioning when you fail and when you sin, am I saved? Does Jesus still love me? If he started the work, he will finish the work. The same power that saved you is the same power that will keep you Whenever we sin, Jesus doesn't say, okay, that's one too many. I'm done with you. I'm moving on to the next person. Jesus looks at you and says, Father, put that on my account. He's mine. I bought him with my blood. He will always pray for us. He will always hear us. He will always intercede for us. He will never give up on you. Look at verse 11. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. I'm coming to you. Father, protect them by your name those that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. Jesus is headed to the cross now, and he's headed to the grave now, and so he asked the Father to keep them close, to preserve them, to watch over them, to protect them, to guard them. But I love how Jesus here calls him Father. Because when people wonder if they can lose their salvation, you need to be reminded that he is our Father. Now listen, I know that some of you might have had crummy dads, absent dads, abusive dads. And when you think of the word father, that's not a good imagery. But listen, our father in heaven is the best of fathers. He is the father you wish you had, but even better. He doesn't walk out on his children. He doesn't leave them unprotected because he loves them. He's your father. He wants you to trust him that he is a loving father and that he has you, always has you, and will never let you go. Verse 12. While I was with them, I was protecting them by your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them is lost except the son of destruction so that the scripture may be fulfilled. Jesus says he kept them safe. He defended them, and he looked after them, and now he is entrusting us to the father. And Jesus brings up the obvious argument against eternal security. That's Judas. Judas' departure was evidence that Judas was never really part of Jesus, that Judas was never in love with Jesus. It was all part of God's sovereign plan written in scriptures long before. Judas' betrayal, friends, didn't catch Jesus by surprise. It was always going to be this way. Listen, if you're going to live your life on mission for Jesus, 
into a world that hates you, in a world that will reject you, if you're going to rescue and restore a people that mock you and want nothing to do with the gospel, then you're going to need to, you're going to, need to do it for God's glory, and you're going to need to be anchored. You need to know that the boat that you're on will not capsize. You need to know that Jesus will not abandon you. You need to know that Jesus will not forsake you. You need to know that the rope that is tied around your waist is tied to Jesus on the other end so that as you go into the dark holes of this world that you are held tight by a loving Savior and known and heard by Jesus himself that when you call on him, he hears you. Number one, glorify God. Number two, trust God. Number three, be filled with joy. Be filled with joy. Verse 13, now I'm coming to you and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy completed in them. Notice, Jesus wants them to be satisfied in himself so that they are on mission, my joy. Jesus, friends, wants us to be happy missionaries, which are typically the most effective kind, by the way. I don't know if you were really moved by a guy who was really angry and yelling at you how sinful you are and just thought, oh, wow, I want to be like him, right? He wants us to be happy people. He wants to be, us to be full of joy. He wants us to communicate to the world that God loves you, that God has delighted in me and called me his son, and he wants you to know that as well. And friends, this is not a joy that is minimal or temporary. This is a deep down confidence that God has us and that God is working through us and that God is going to be glorified in us. But friends, there are two things that will try to swipe our joy away from us. The world and Satan. The world and Satan will try to take our joy from us. Look at verse 14. I have given them your word. The world hated them because they were not of the world, as I am not of the world. I am not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Listen, and Satan knows better than you know that God has wired you in such a way to want to desire satisfaction. And Satan knows that satisfaction is found in Jesus. So he wants you to try to be satisfied in something else. And the world is simply a tool in the hands of Satan. He's always pulling this bait and switch tactic with us. He dangles things in front of us to get us off of mission from Jesus, to get us to stop pursuing Jesus. He's trying to get us to build our own kingdom and invest in our own kingdom, to pursue our own happiness. He wants us to seek our kingdom first and to our will to be done, having us believe that the most satisfying thing is whatever we desire. But friends, that's a lie. Satan says there are better things that you can do with your life than be committed to Jesus. Telling people about Jesus, living your life on mission for Jesus, helping the poor, fighting for social justice, those are not good things. They'll leave you worn out. they leave you exhausted. Don't pursue those. He wants you to be self-absorbed. Worry about your own life. Worry about your own struggles. Satan is constantly trying to get you off mission by dangling these pseudo-joy things in front of you. He disguises the hook so that when you bite, he then guilts you. He then hooks you with guilt and shame. So you sit on the sign light and become ineffective to the mission that Jesus called you. But Jesus is saying, joy is found in him and being on mission for him. Friends, don't buy the lie that satisfaction will come by making more money, being more comfortable, being more safe, and getting all that you want in life. Satisfaction will only come when you know Jesus and you make him known. Number four, advance in holiness. Advance in holiness. Look at verse 16. They are not of the world, as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. I sanctify myself for them, so that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Jesus says that our mission of being in the world is not to be of the world. He says that we are to be sanctified. That word means to be set apart, just like Jesus was. How was Jesus set apart? He was very much in the world. In fact, the world would accuse him of being a drunkard and a sinner because of the places that he went and the people that he associated with. 
He went to social events. He talked to people that no one else would talk to, and he did it on their turf. He didn't just sit there and say, well, they'll just come to church one day and they'll just get saved. He went to them. Jesus was in the world. Jesus lived among them. But he didn't become part of the world system. Jesus didn't give in to the values of their time. He was a single guy that had many single lady friends, but he wasn't a womanizer or sleeping around. He and his disciples had money, but they didn't spend it all on themselves, but they gave it away, especially to the poor. He had all the power in the world, and he didn't use it to squash the Roman government or annihilate the religious leaders that stood opposed to him. Instead, he used the things that were entrusted to him to heal, to mend, to forgive. And you and I are to operate as missionaries in our cultures much of the same way. As followers of Jesus, we believe that sex is a gift from God to be celebrated within the confines of marriage. We believe that money is given to us by God to provide for our needs and to help meet the needs of others. We believe power is given to us to serve, not to step on people on the way up the corporate ladder so we can get our positions and power and authority. Bottom line is that we are constantly striving to strike a balance between being a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Between being in the world but not of the world. Between being in isolation and engaging in the community that God has placed us in. And friends, this is what the essence of what ministry or being on mission is. And we constantly need to define that in the culture that we find ourselves in. This is why you cannot do this thing by yourself. This is why you need to be in community. This is why you need to be in Bible studies with men and women around you to say, hey, pursue Jesus, follow Jesus. Yes, that sounds appealing, but listen, that will leave you disappointed. You need people in your life to speak that into you. The followers of Jesus are permitted neither the luxury of compromise nor the safety of disengagement. But many times we end up as Christians leaning toward one side or the other. Many Christians can be escapists. The Pharisees did this because they were contaminated by the world. Third century Christians fled to the deserts of Egypt because they weren't, didn't want anything to do with the world. And the rise of monasticism happened because Christians wanted to be separated. And that can happen today when you guys are only with other believers when we isolate ourselves from the world and fail to engage with non-believers because we're so absorbed with our Christian subcultures. And we need to be careful of that. The mission is to remain in the world, not run away from it like Jonah did, but be like Jesus and live in it. Christianity was never meant to withdraw a man from life in the world. And yet I see the church many times running from the world. And Jesus, in this passage, in this prayer, is sending us into the world and reminding us that he has us in the process. So how do you determine the balance between being in the world and out of the world? Verse 17. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. See, the truth of Scripture is our compass, is what guides us is the truth of Scripture is what keeps our compass pointing north. We are to be sanctified by it, get our directions from it as we are sent out. Jesus doesn't sanctify you, reveal himself to you, in order for you to just simply sit and soak and sour. The goal of being set apart, the goal of being made more into the image of Jesus is so that you and I can be on mission for Jesus. It is to make you a better, more effective missionary for Jesus. Holiness is being like Jesus, not just abstaining from certain things that the church says is bad. It is becoming more like Jesus. Jesus was a man on mission to seek and save the lost. And so if you want to be holy and like Jesus, you need to be on mission for Jesus. You can't isolate yourself. So our goal as missionaries is to avoid the conservative tendency to stay out of the world, but to avoid the liberal tendency to become part of the world. As followers of Jesus, we're not called to be conservatives or liberals. We are of a different kingdom. We belong to a different leader. We march to the drumbeat of a different drum. 
we pursue Jesus. It is the truth of scriptures that will keep us balanced, constantly going back saying, what does the Bible say? What does Jesus say? What is Jesus calling me to do? Some of you need to get out of your Christian ghettos and engage and build relationships with lost people and others in need. Others of you need to repent because you've compromised, that you've made, then you've engaged more in the world, and the world doesn't know that you follow Jesus or love Jesus. You become so much like the world that they don't even know. Listen, if the shoe fits, wear it. We need to pursue Jesus. We need to follow Jesus. And as Jesus lived, we need to live. Number five, be unified. Be unified. Verse 20. I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their message. May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. May they also be one in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. So Jesus now turns and he begins to pray for the fruit of the disciples' mission, and he prays for you and I here today. Friends, you and I believe because of those who have gone before us to pass this book to us. I'm here this morning as your pastor because 2,000 years ago, St. Thomas, when Jesus sent him as a missionary, decided to go to India and preach the gospel and be martyred for the sake of the gospel and so that Indian people could know Jesus. I'm here today because earlier in the last century when the Indian community began to drift away from the gospel, God sent missionaries from North America to India to preach the gospel and bring us back to Jesus. There are many men and women who have died for this sake, for your sake and my sake, so that this morning we can sit here and know the truth of the gospel. This book has cost people life, lives. And the only way that you and I will carry it out is not individually, but corporately as a local church. And Jesus again comes back to this topic, you're to love one another. You're to love one another and you're to be unified together. Now listen, this unity is not uniformity like we all wear matching white shirts every Sunday morning. That's not what Jesus is saying. We should be different. We should have different opinions. We should have different convictions. We should have different approaches to mission. But underlying all that stuff should be our love for Jesus, our love for one another, and love for the truths of the Bible. I am amazed at how different we are. I am constantly reminded. We've got folks that will bleed red politically. We have folks that will bleed blue politically. We are a purple church. We're a mix of everything. We have folks that are socially conservative, financially conservative, and on the other side. We have folks that think differently, believe differently. We came from different backgrounds. And what makes us unique is our love for one another is that we will gather together week in and week out, not just simply gather and depart, but we will genuinely love and care for each other. Friends, I don't know about you, but what God is doing in our midst is an answer to the prayer that Jesus prays in John 17. What we have here is special. And I don't say that simply as your pastor. I say that because I've never dreamed this could happen. But Jesus did it. And he did it for his glory and his honor, underlying all the extra stuff that should divide us, should separate us, should keep us away from each other, is our love for Jesus, our love for one another, and love for the truth of God's word. We each individually need to be living in loving communion with God and then in loving communion with one another that will result in God's presence through us, touching the world in forgiving, cleansing, healing, liberating, transforming grace. Look at verse 22. I think I'm almost done. I've given them the glory that you've given me. May they be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they be completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. See, our unity 
isn't about us. Our unity will show the world that Jesus is a loving rescuer. The world should be able to look at us and see that we have been changed by grace from the inside out and that we have a love for one another that just doesn't make sense. The world will know that God has sent Jesus simply, not just to pronounce it to be, but when they see Jesus' life in us, they will see Jesus through us. And unfortunately, the world looks at the church and they see unredeemed madness. May it not be so with Lost City. Verse 24, Father, I desire that you have given me to be with, I desire those you have given me to be with me where I am that they will see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the world's foundation. Righteous Father, the world has not known you, however I have known you, and these have known that you have sent me. I have made your name known to them and will make it known so that the love you have loved me with may be in them and I in them. See, this transformation will only happen when we're caught up in the glory of Jesus. There will be a day when we will see him as he really is and we won't fight about the dumb things that we fight about today. There will be a day where we will stand in front of Jesus and in fact we will be ashamed of all the meaningless things that we've quarreled about as we encounter the glory and the majesty of Jesus. We will be captured by his glory and everything else will begin to fade in the background. But friends, you and I can be captured by that glory even now, Jesus is about to conclude his prayer and he's going to head to the Garden of Gethsemane where he will be betrayed, denied, and left alone. He'll be tried and convicted and sentenced to die on a gruesome cross. But there at the cross, we will see the greatest display of glory. There at the cross, Jesus, God himself, will take the penalty we deserve and take the blows for us, become sin for us to the extent where the Father will now go silent on him so that you and I can live with him forever. Back in 2007, there was a movie that was created called Pride. And it was a story of the first African-American swim team in Philadelphia that formed against all odds. And in the film, we find a young man who didn't take the scene seriously and never showed up to practice on time. At one time, at one point, he was finally broken to be a part of the mission and to see the team succeed. How did that happen? One day, he came to practice late, and the team had been practicing and was exhausted and tired. He got dressed, and the coach told him that because he was late, that they would have to swim 100 laps because he was late. But the coach made him sit on the sidelines and said his teammates would have to swim for him. And so they started to swim. And they swam, and they struggled to reach the 100 laps, and the young man got mad and was getting ready to walk out. But he looked at his teammates who took his penalty for him, and he was melted by their commitment to him and their love for him, even though he was the reason they were suffering. And in that moment, he was changed, and he engaged in the mission. Friends, Jesus did that, and more than that for you. He didn't just struggle while you sat there and watched. He died while you stood there and cheered, and you mocked him. But it is in his death that forgave you and welcomed you into his family. And it's the same death that moves you to be sent just as you have been sent. Verse 18 says, as he sent me into the world, I also send you into the world. As we go into communion... Would you reflect on Jesus' prayer here? Can I invite you to just close your eyes and just listen as I ask these questions and just meditate for a second? Are you living to make much of Jesus? Are you living to make much of Jesus? Are you trusting that God has you? Are you trusting that God has you? And if he has you, what risks are you taking for his name? Are you filled with joy because you belong to Jesus? 
Does your life overflow with joy when other people see you? Are you spreading the joy that you have to other people? Are you so much in the world that the world doesn't know that you belong to Jesus? Are you so out of the world that you have no one that you can point toward Jesus? Are you on mission for Jesus or are you just taking up space? As the Holy Spirit convicts you this morning, as the Holy Spirit ministers to you this morning, would you respond to him? Would you respond to what Jesus is asking of you this morning? Maybe he's respond, dealing with you in a way different than he's dealing with me. But as he ministers to you, would you respond? When you're ready this morning, if you're a follower of Jesus today, you can come to the table you could take the bread and juice that represents the body and blood of Jesus that was broken, poured out for you. If you need prayer this morning, Roman and um, Lauren are in the back, ready to pray with you and would love to pray with you. Whether it's something that the Spirit is convicting of you this morning in regards to the sermon or you want prayer for something that's going on in your life, would you just swing back there, pray with them, and then come take communion together? Friends, if you don't know Jesus this morning, if all this talk about Jesus' glory and mission is just foreign to you, if you have questions, would you just come back there, pray with one of us, or talk with one of us? We'd love to tell you about Jesus and why we love him. We're grateful that you're here, and we're grateful that God has brought you here. We didn't bring you here. God did. And we want you to love Jesus and follow Jesus and encounter Jesus the way many in this room have. And would you respond to him this morning? So would you take a moment? Would you just meditate on the questions would you ask Jesus to make you more like him? And then when you're ready, would you come, grab the elements from the table, and let's worship as we remember the finished work of Jesus that has allowed us to be a part of his family this morning. Let's worship.